The Oklahoma Sooners picked up a win, winning in all three phases over the Iowa State Cyclones on Saturday, and we're here to talk it about it, break it all down for you on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation, and welcome to Locked On Sooners, a victory Monday edition of Locked On Sooners for the second uh, game in a row. It's been two out of the last three weeks. My name is John Williams, and you can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. He's Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. And thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all podcast platforms. Josh, what a win for the Oklahoma Sooners on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. It- sets the table for Oklahoma to potentially end the season and have Sooner fans feeling like it's, it's not an outright disaster, right? I mean, one step forward in that department, uh, you know, the big storyline coming, well, at least for me going into the Oklahoma, Iowa state game, I guess I can't say the big storyline period. Right. But in in one person's opinion, the big storyline was would Oklahoma's defense be able to against an Iowa state offense that, statistically did not look very good in a bunch of different key categories. Was Oklahoma's defense going to be able to put together one of its finest games since really the trip up to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska? And, John, if we just start there, Oklahoma did that. Yeah, that was key. To see an Oklahoma defense who did some nice things against Kansas, again, they gave up a bunch of points, but they did do a few nice things in that game. To come up against a team like Iowa State, who's averaging just 22 points a game, wasn't really doing a whole lot on either either in the running game or the passing game. Hunter Deckers is a player that has been throwing some interceptions this season. This is what you wanted to see out of this defense. Playing against a team that, you know, they've had some success here and there offensively moving the football, but it's not something that's been consistent. So you wanted to see an Oklahoma defense actually take advantage of that, and they did. Iowa State moved the ball. I mean, there are certainly things that the defense needs to continue to work on, and we'll talk about that at some point as well. But Oklahoma was able to get stops when they needed to get stops. They got three interceptions on the day, got a sack, got seven tackles for loss, absolutely dominated the running game. Like uh, Jarrell Brock came in, sorry, Jarrell Brock came in averaging five yards a carry in this one. He averaged two yards a carry against the Oklahoma Sooners. They held the Iowa State Cyclones to just 66 rushing yards on 27 attempts. A lot's been made of how many times Hunter Deckers had to throw the football, but guess what? They weren't able to do anything running the football. So what are you going to do? Just keep running into an Oklahoma defense that was basically shutting you down on the ground? It's not really a recipe for success either, especially when you get down uh, 10-3, you get down, I think they were down 13-6 and then 16-6. And then, you know, late in the game was 20 to 6 and then 27-13. You got to throw the football at that point. You, you know, in the second half, you got to do something. But Oklahoma's defense, they they kind of rallied and, and rose to the occasion when they needed to make the plays that they needed to make. Uh, obviously, you know, the two fourth down conversions, fourth and 11, fourth and 12 conversions, basically back to back uh, to make it, what was it, 20 to 13 at that point? Not great. But again, three interceptions. You, you, you really dominate on the ground in the running game. You make it to where Hunter Deckers is only averaging a little over five yards per attempt. Yeah, he threw a bunch of times and he did make some, make some plays. Uh, but that just happens, you know, and it's, and it's okay. Like this is a step forward, a step in the right direction for an Oklahoma defense that again, had given up 40 plus points in four straight big 12 games. So to be able to hold an opponent to 13 points, that's absolutely huge. I don't care who the opponent is. It doesn't matter. You weren't stopping anybody the last, you know, four games in big 12 play. This was a confidence booster not just for the the team, but I feel like for the fan base as well as they move forward for the rest of the 2022 season. Yeah, I mean, not to totally move the goalpost on Oklahoma, but I do think, you know, the lens with which you grade this defense has to have been adjusted a little bit, right, by how the, the year has gone so far. So with that in mind, it was a great performance for Oklahoma defensively. The 
takeaways that you mentioned, the ability to make Iowa State one-dimensional uh, to, to what you offered up earlier. Yeah, it was 5.4 yards per pass for Hunter Deckers, which really against anybody, that's a pretty good number, right? 5.4 yards per pass. So the fact that he throws for over 300 yards, uh, you know, really that's – I don't think anything to be too upset about when – It's empty, you know, empty yards. Empty yards, and the most important stat of all, John, is the 13 points – on the scoreboard, right? Which for Oklahoma, really, really good in that regard. And, you know, after the way the last however many games for, uh, I think, uh, as you pointed out right there, played out for OU to hold anybody, I don't care if they're good offense, bad offense, best offense, worst offense. If they hold anybody right now to 13 points, you feel good about it. And obviously, uh, obviously that's what Oklahoma was able to do in this game versus Iowa State. So, the takeaways, that was great to see for OU. I thought the fact that, uh, you know, really, if you just kind of break down some of the individual receiving numbers, John, the fact that Xavier Hutchinson was targeted 17 times, only caught 10 passes, and finished with 72. You look at what Xavier Hutchinson's been doing to a lot of people, and it's been quite a bit more explosive than that. So the way that OU defended Hutchinson, I thought, was was good. So, man, you're not going to hear a bunch of complaints from me about uh, – really Oklahoma defensively in this game. If anything, uh, you know, the the other side of the football, some inability uh, at times to finish off drives was more problematic, John, for OU. Yeah, it absolutely was. And, and I, I want to spend more time talking about the offensive side, but I got a few more things I want to discuss on the defense real quick. Six missed tackles in this game, according to Pro Football Focus. That is a big improvement from what we've seen the rest of the season. I mean, they've had games where they've had 18 missed tackles, 20 missed tackles, 15 missed tackles to basically cut that in a, you know, by half or a third. That is a big difference. Like that makes all of the difference in your team because now you're not giving up, you know, what would have been a, a five yard completion is now turning into a 10 yard, you know, gain. You're not giving up what would, you know, was a three yard run into a seven yard run. Like it makes a huge difference, these missed tackles. And, credit to the team and to the coaching staff for figuring out a way to make that work and, and improving upon that during the bye week because they had to get better. That was something like it's a lot of times it wasn't because they weren't getting into position to make the play. It's just, they were getting beat in the one-on-one -on -one situation on the outside and credit to them. They figured out a way to respond and, and improve upon that. They had to against an Iowa state team. Like you can't give them any life. If you make mistakes Big 12 teams are going to kill you. We've seen it all year long. And if you make mistakes against a team that isn't as good as you and you give them life because you missed a tackle, missed an assignment, that's not great. That's going to put, that's going to give them a lot of momentum and give them opportunities to seize that. And I mean, we saw what they could do at different times during the game where they could make some things happen in, in the offensive, you know, the passing game in particular, the fact that they weren't allowing second chance opportunities. I know that's a basketball term, but you miss a tackle that provides a second chance to, for this team, the offense to gain extra yards. So the fact that they didn't allow that, they were really sound defensively. I think it was the most kind of complete game defensively that they've played maybe since Nebraska, uh, but even maybe more complete than that, where they were able to you know, get off the field with greater regularity. They were able to create some turnovers, get some more pressure and, not miss as many tackles and then be pretty dominant in the running game. But again, probably as good as it's been since Nebraska. The defensive glass, Oklahoma was great, right? One and done one shot and uh, back on offense. If uh, we're talking basketball terms here, the yeah. basketball glossary, uh, Deshaun white, I thought had a, a terrific game uh, just individually. I mean, obviously just one quick peek at the stat sheet would tell you that, but uh, 14 tackles, one and a half uh, tackles for loss, but just watching him, right? The different things that he did, uh, obviously in the TFL department, uh, in the coverage department, he was all over the place. So I thought his best game of the season, Woody Washington uh, has been, uh, you know, up and down. And though the interception probably was not an interception, it stood as an interception. So I thought Woody Washington had a, a big step in the right direction individually. And then just kind of the uh, way the game played out itself, John, I thought, one play, the Danny Stutzman interception was a good illustration of a little bit what you were talking about right there. And I would phrase it like this. 
Oklahoma played well enough, John. It, it, this is, you know, you hear this term a lot, basketball glossary. Again, you hear it a lot when uh, you're talking about basketball. I thought Oklahoma in this game for the first time in the last, you know, month or so applied game pressure to its opponent, right? I thought that, you know, you saw that on the Danny Stutzman interception to where, look, it's Deckers throws it right to him, right to Danny Stutzman. That's one of those plays you're like, how, how did he throw it? right to Danny Stutzman, but he did. And part of the reason that that happened, John, is because of the other successful plays defensively that Oklahoma was able to string together before it, right? All of a sudden, you've got a, a quarterback back there that, you know, pocket doesn't seem like he has as, as much time in it. Run game, he can't rely on that. And all of a sudden, you make a bad decision, right? And uh, yes, you can chalk that up to a poor play by a quarterback, poor quarterback play. And I would agree with you. I've got you're not going to get an argument from me on that. It was a terrible decision by Hunter Deckers, but I do think that is, again, an illustration, John, of Oklahoma did positive things defensively, and guess what? You get rewarded when you do positive things. Absolutely, and Oklahoma had Hunter Deckers under pressure on 26.7% of his uh, dropbacks. Reggie Grimes led the team with four pressures. Jordan Kelly had the sack, but you're right. When you play with a lead – it's going to create up, especially when you're an offense that's as explosive as Oklahoma's can be. They weren't necessarily in this game, but they have that potential. It puts more pressure on lesser offenses to try and keep up. And that's what leads to mistakes. We're going to speak more about the offense coming up here in a second. But first I want to talk to you about bet online. Bet online is the fastest and the easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports, including football and basketball. It's going the NBA NHL season is underway. College basketball is right around the corner and you can find all of the matchups and lines over at bet online. Again, it's your number one source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport. Why go anywhere else? They've got the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all your favorite games, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online is where the game starts. And right now, the Oklahoma Sooners go into their home matchup against the Baylor Bears as a minus three favorite. Uh, right now, the over under is sitting at 59 between Oklahoma and Baylor. So, really intriguing line. I mean, Baylor's playing good football right now. Oklahoma's playing pretty good football over the last couple of weeks as well. Uh, to be favored at home by three basically puts it kind of in push territory uh, as far as the the odds makers would be concerned. So, this is basically a pick 'em game. Uh, but as we look at this one, uh, Oklahoma's win over Iowa State. The offense wasn't great. It was a do what you need to do kind of a kind of a win for them. One area I feel like they were great, and this might come with some debate a little bit, is in the running game. You know, they rushed for 186 yards per during the game, 3.9 yards per carry, not a great yards per carry total. But Iowa State coming into the game had only allowed 105 rushing yards per game, 3.3 yards per carry. So Oklahoma was able to far exceed the total rushing yards, and then they exceeded the yards per carry. Eric Gray, five yards a carry, another really, really solid game, ran tough all game long. And it, I think this is just more evidence that the offensive line for the Oklahoma Sooners has really hit its stride over the last months of the, month of the season. I think they're playing really, really good football, and they're going to need to be, speaking of Baylor, coming up next week. But just your overarching thoughts on the offense, Josh, and what you thought about them playing this Saturday. Eric Gray is uh, really, really playing well. You know, once again, like you said, over the uh, century mark, he had uh, the late score that really put the football game on ice for Oklahoma. So uh, was impressed with him. I thought just, you know, I, I know Oklahoma ran it a lot more than they threw it in this game, but good balance offensively, uh, both running and throwing the ball. If you're looking for positive 182 on the ground, buck 50 through the air. I do think when you're evaluating the offense, I mean, important to keep in mind that, look, this is the best defense Oklahoma has played in Iowa State. So Iowa State gave them some problems, just like sort of we suspected coming in. Iowa State's uh, defense could give Oklahoma some problems. OU finished with just 332 yards of total offense and had the exact same average per play as Iowa State, right? And we're talking about what a great defensive day it was for Oklahoma, and it was both teams finished with four and a half uh, average yards per play. So it was against a good defense. It was, like you said, John, I agree with you, kind of just a ho-hum day. I thought one of the problems for Oklahoma was that 
you know, your three scoring drives in the first half, you, your offense didn't really get you into the end zone. You, you got into the end zone, but it was on the fake field goal, right? I mean, obviously you you had been stopped and uh, credit Oklahoma for, for pulling out the stops in the fake in a moment where it was beautifully executed, perfectly done on that front. But, you know, for the offense, obviously that's three drives in the first half that you scored, but you didn't quite get into the end zone. So that was pro- part of the problem early, John, was that they, they had, you know, multiple scoring drives, but didn't finish them off. But I'll give credit to Oklahoma in this regard. You know, on that standpoint, guess what? You know, when this game, you know, tightened up a little bit, uh, obviously in the second half, Jaleel Farouk, big touchdown, and then uh, obviously the, the final score to Eric Gray. So Oklahoma was able to put the game away with what they did offensively. So it was, again, kind of ho-hum versus a good defense, and yet, I thought the second half, the ability of Oklahoma, again, to put the game away, John, I thought that part was good. Yeah, it's it's really easy to think of this as kind of a an average performance for this offense. And and I, I think it's a fair thing to say. They could have been better in certain certain areas. You know, Marvin Mims did not have his best game in short yardage. The Oklahoma running game needed to be better as well. But again, this is the third, only the third time that Iowa State's allowed an opponent to score more than 20 points in a season. And it's the second highest point total that Iowa State's allowed all year. Baylor had the highest point total a few weeks ago. Oklahoma's 27, then Texas with just 24. So in that context, it was a really good performance. Like it was a really strong performance offensively. Now the interceptions help you get better field position and, and have a better chance to score but that's just part of playing a complete football game, playing a complimentary football game. When you get opportunities to have a short field, taking advantage of it and making those big plays. And let's talk about the special teams unit because Zach Schmidt, I mean, he had a huge impact in this game. I mean, kicking all year long has been a strength for the Oklahoma Sooners, whether it's the place kicking or the punter, Michael Turk, it's been fantastic all season long. And that really shown through today or on Saturday when, uh, you know, Schmidt had the, the two field goals, he had the the fake field goal. They they called it a reception, but I mean the you know the fake field goal touchdown. It's really cool to see how that they've been able to kind of to evolve that fake field goal because we saw it a few weeks ago. I was it against Kansas or was it against Texas? I can't remember exactly, but uh, Michael Turk takes the snap and then kind of just throws it from his holding position out to Schmidt as he's running. Uh, to the left, and he's able to get wide enough and and pick up the first down in the game, you know. And then they kind of had a bit of a variation on it this time as more of a run play. And dude, Schmidt, he's got the he's got the athleticism. It's pretty pretty impressive. But just the special teams unit's ability to contribute in such a a significant way, even if you take away the the fake field goal touchdown, which was huge, just his ability to just be automatic as a kicker has been so valuable for this team, but then you add the the touchdown and that's just the cherry on top, man. It was absolutely phenomenal. And it's what it's the kind of performance that they needed on a day like Saturday when they're going up against the best defense in the big 12, you got to have your special teams contribute in a significant way. And that happened on Saturday. Well, it set the tone for the game, right? I mean, if uh, let's say Oklahoma runs that fake and it gets stuffed, the, you know, just looking at, you know, the final score, I mean, all things being equal, you win the game 20 to 13, but obviously the the ebbs and flows of the game would have been totally different. It was a massive, massive play in the game to just stake Oklahoma out to a comfortable lead that they, you know, really possessed throughout, for the most part, the, the entirety of the game. Yeah, it was one score here and there, but it never really felt right. Like Oklahoma was in danger of losing this game, which uh, obviously, you know, throughout the three-game losing streak, you know, well, a couple of the games you got blown out. And then the other game, uh, you were trying to play catch up the whole way. And certainly you felt like you were in danger of losing it. I don't know that I necessarily had that feeling versus Kansas. I kind of, you know, sort of felt like Oklahoma was in control of that one throughout, though, obviously defensively, you were much, much better versus Iowa State, all of which is to a roundabout way get to saying that again, yes, that play was a huge, huge play and just kind of the trajectory of the way the football game itself felt John and statistically now Zach Schmidt is eight of nine on the season kicking he's just uh, missed the one from inside the 30 to 39 distance and you know 41 yards is not a total chip shot field goal 34 that you know is kind of the range to me that 
yeah, you should be making anything that's inside of 40 yards, but we do see kicks like that get get pulled or missed every every now and again. But guess what? Schmidt didn't do that. And then just uh, Michael per Mike, excuse me, Michael Turk. You mentioned him, John. Uh, six punts and no big deal, right? He averaged uh, 49 yards per punt. Two that got downed inside the 20, which in a game like uh, at times how Saturday played out, field position very important. Well, and that final punt that uh, they down like right at the one yard line. So Iowa State goes and they score, make it 20 to 13. Oklahoma on the next possession, they have to punt. How huge is it that he's able to down it at the one and back Iowa State up? And basically, we talked about game pressure. Like, yes, they picked up the first down on on that first you know set of downs, but if you're not backed up on the one, like, what what's Hunter Decker's feeling if he's getting to start at the twenty versus starting at the one? It's a totally different ball game at that point. He's yes, again, they make the play, they get out of the the you know the shadow of their own end zone, but when you have to start a drive like that. That's a lot of pressure on an offense. So, you know, the special teams unit, absolutely phenomenal. You mentioned Jalil Farouk earlier. And I think it's really important to not under understate how big of a performance that was. Marvin Mims didn't play well. Mm-mm. Jalil Farouk got targeted four times. He caught all four passes, 74 yards and a touchdown. He also ran the ball two times for 26 yards. So 100 total yards on the day for him, according to Pro Football Focus. Huge, absolutely huge. He's had two games in a row now where he's caught every single pass that's been thrown his way. You got to have that from your, maybe your wide receiver two at this point and the guy that you project probably to be your wide receiver one in 2023. You got to start seeing him emerge and he's really doing that. Uh, You know, against Kansas, again, he just had the four catches for something like 44 yards, 45 yards, something like that but then has a much bigger performance in this game. Obviously the attention is going to go to Marvin Mims for a lot of defensive coordinators, but that's when you need your, your wide receiver two, your wide receiver three to really stand out and make plays when they're getting their number called. And Jalil Farouk's really done that. I feel like he's really kind of settled in, you know, even against Texas when he was only throwing the ball one time, he still had a significant impact running the football. I think he had five carries for 60 yards. Uh, and then the previous week against TCU didn't really get a lot of opportunities in the passing game, but had a huge impact in the special team. So like over the last four games of the season, Jalil Farouk has really started to make a huge impact for this team. And I think it's going to continue an upward trajectory for him. Well, and you know, just specifically the last two weeks, right? I mean, eight grabs for over 100 yards and really, I mean, obviously his, his big touchdown, was uh, gigantic in winning the football game for OU, but you needed that type of contribution on, a, as you pointed out, a, and I'm not going to sit here and, you know, pick on Marvin Mims because obviously he's been largely fantastic uh, starring type player for Oklahoma just about every time he's taken the field. But this was the the rare instance where Marvin Mims flat out wasn't good in the game. I mean, he was not good. He was not himself. He uh, had plays that were there on his targets to be made, and he dropped passes when Oklahoma needed him to to go make a couple of catches. So all of that is to say that, hey, credit to Jaleel Farouk, right? When uh, you're not getting those types of contributions that you're accustomed to getting from some of your key cogs, okay, well, that's where depth comes into play, right? That's where, uh, dare I use a St. Louis Cardinals uh, motto here, but next man up, right? That's the Cardinal way. Somebody steps up and uh, it makes a play. And obviously Farouk was able to do that for the Sooners. And then the other thing I want to mention is Dylan Gabriel's game. It wasn't great. At the same time, it's what it needed to be in this matchup. Like he played the game that you're supposed to play against an inferior offensive opponent. You just don't give them any life by making mistakes. And he didn't do that. I felt like he played a solid game. Again, he didn't really get a lot of help from his number one wide receiver. But he made the throws that were there to make and didn't turn the football over, didn't make the mistakes that were going to give Iowa State any kind of life. So, you know, not a big yardage total, not a big performance from him by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, But, you know, he also ran the ball for 24 yards um, on seven attempts. Not a great yards per carry average for him, but just – solid like this is what you needed from your quarterback you didn't need him to go out there and throw for 300 yards and four touchdowns you didn't need him to go throw you know 250 or try to thread the needle on every single third down sometimes just like living to play another another down or living to play another series is is the best play you can make against a strong iowa state defense so 
I, I really appreciated the performance by Dylan Gabriel, even though it wasn't huge statistically, it's what Oklahoma needed. Again, complimentary football. Your defense was playing really, really good football. Don't put them in harm's way by giving Iowa state good field position off of a turnover, you know, play smart, play wise. I felt like he did a really solid job at that this Saturday. Well, and look, uh, on a day where just, if you're curious what the actual numbers themselves look like, 15 of 26 passing 148, one touchdown, right? So yeah, I mean, not, not your typical statistical day, not anything crazy for Dylan Gabriel, but guess what? The one throw that had to be made in this game to Jaleel Farouk, it's wide open, was made, right? And, hey, it's it's wide open. You have to make that throw. But guess what? All of a sudden, for some reason, you misfire on that throw, overshoot it, under, undershoot it, whatever, and it's a totally different football game. So give him credit for that, and I'm with you. That's one of the keys we talked about was versus a bad offensive team on the road, do not bail I- Iowa State out by giving them short fields with a silly decision. And ultimately, uh, Dylan Gabriel, Oklahoma didn't do that. And that's part of why they won the game. Yeah, and so on that note, I think the coaching staff had a really good game plan for this game. You know, they they looked to blitz Hunter Deckers, put him under a lot of pressure, I think, frequently. They didn't always get there with the blitz, but they did, you know, get there in the running game. Whenever they run blitz, it was effective. Um, the decisions to go for it on down near the goal line with the fake field goal, I think I feel like Brent Venables has a really good feel for when to go for it. I love the aggressiveness. I know sometimes you kind of want to just take some points and just get out of there, but I like the idea that he's not settling for touchdowns. I really like that. Or sorry, not settling for field goals. I really like that, especially in the Big 12, especially with what we're seeing this year. Settling for field goals will get you beat. And I I really love that it's like, hey, when we get an opportunity in a short, you know, a fourth and one situation. We're going to go for it or, and I really love just like the, it's, I mean, it took a lot of gall, like fourth and one down near the goal line to run a fake field goal. Like that took a ton of gall to run it straight into the teeth of the the field goal defense. I mean, I love it. Like I love that aggressive approach. You sometimes you die by the sword, but a lot of times you live by it too. And I, man, a fantastic game. I felt like the defense or sorry, the totality of the coaching staff should get a lot of credit for the performance that Oklahoma put on on Saturday, because I felt like it was just a really solid game plan on both sides of the football. And then the decision-making in game was really, really good as well. No doubt. And that play clearly, John, they have had that in the back pocket. It was so well executed, right? I mean, every piece of it, you know, the exchange between uh, obviously Turk to Schmidt was perfect in that regard, right? It wasn't uh, bobbled around in any way, shape or form right there, which, you know, play like that can can go wrong. You see plays like that go wrong sometimes, uh, sometimes from guys that are being asked to operate a fake that they very rarely get asked to operate. So that didn't happen. That's that's step A, right, uh, in the play. And then the other part of that, part B, was, John, I thought, like, if you go back and rewatch just the fake itself, the blocking to cave it into where – Dude, Schmidt just runs right into the end zone untouched. It was so well executed top to bottom by Oklahoma to where, uh, you know, the right time, right juncture in the game to, to call uh, the fake there. You know, just, it did just the rest of it. The execution was perfect. So uh, absolutely, it was huge. Yeah, and it was just an all-around really strong performance for Oklahoma that really sets the stage for the final four games of the season. I know bowl eligibility should never be the goal at Oklahoma, but – for this season, for what's happened, what's transpired with you know the first three, four games of Big 12 play, it's okay to kind of reset your goal, reset your expectation. We can start worrying about you know college football playoff, national championships for 2023 when we get to the 2023 offseason and start building towards that. But I think this these last two games have been just the sign that Oklahoma is building something. There is improvement happening. We're seeing it week to week so far. And now we just hope that we can see that take another step against Baylor. Who's been really solid this year at times, you know, they've had, you know, different two game win streak, two game lose streak, two game win streak uh, against, you know, they just 
picked up a big win over Texas Tech in Lubbock. So it's going to be another tough matchup. There's no off week in the Big 12 this year. So this is going to be another really, really fun game. But we're going to continue to talk about Iowa State as we go through the week. And then we'll start getting you ready for Baylor as well. We'll go around the Big 12 and kind of catch you up on what happened this weekend uh, in the conference. And then we'll also take a look at what happened around the nation as well uh, on our next episode of Locked On Sooners. But again, thanks so much for tuning in. He's Josh Helmer. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. Listen to him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref. I'm John Williams. You can read my work covering the Sooners over at thesoonerswire.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And remember to make Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. But now for your second listen, go check on the check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. It's the latest stories from the previous night's games in 20 minutes, getting you caught up on everything that you might normally get caught up with on the worldwide leader or another big sports network. This one, it comes straight to you through your podcast or your YouTube feed. So go check them out, subscribe to their show as well. But until next time, again, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams. We'll catch you then. Boomer sooner.